Trades Minister Alan Tremanteng has stated former government appointees will have to answer questions about the current state of the Commander Sugar Factory, which cost the country $35 million. The factory remains defunct despite the massive amount of money used to establish it three years ago. Alan Tremanteng in April this year told Parliament the factory will be sold to a new investor at a depreciated value of $12 million. The value, he says, was the outcome of an independent valuation. The land size available for cultivation um, of sugar to run the factory at full capacity is also not available. That's part of the technical constraints. I've alluded also to the fact that the soil conditions uh, is a technical challenge uh, because that will create a, a fundamental problem of competitiveness. Uh, I've also alluded to the fact, uh, Honorable Speaker, that there was no viable grow outgrower scheme that could support a new clause plantation. These are all related to the technical challenges that I've spoken about. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in reference to the financial uh, uh, challenges, the previous government took a loan of $35 million to as it were, uh, establish this fund. We've done a series of financial valuations, and on record, the value that is put now on the factory is significantly less than the uh, value of the plant, as uh, one would determine based on the loan that uh, was. Uh, was, was procured. And in actual fact, the original exercise that was commissioned to divest government's interest in this factory was clear that most of the bidders were not prepared to pay $35 million for, for, for the factory. So we have had to deal also with that uh, challenge and um, a forensic audit uh, has actually been commissioned uh, uh, to go into this exercise. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that the paid evaluation process has been completed by the transaction advisor and a recommendation has been made for the consideration of the ministry and of cabinet. So, Speaker, I envisage that the final decision in respect of this matter will be taken by the end of April uh, this year. Well, we appear to have come to that point, and that was the uh, trade minister speaking back in April. The minority expressed disappointment in government's decision. Member of Parliament for Commander Edine Guafu, Abraham Samuel Atamils, in an interview with Joy News, described it as an armed robbery. If they are valuing this at $12 million, that is armed robbery. How can a country borrow $35 million to build a factory? And this factory was valued at $35 million when it was built. How come a very short time you are telling us that it's valued at $12 million? What happened to the $22 or $23 million? Well, the Trades Minister has some justification for it. Mr. Chairman Ting says it was, he also adds that it was the former administration which first attempted to sell the company for much less than the initial amount invested in it. You're absolutely right. I do not just uh, issue um, <clears throat> a statement, an update uh, to Parliament. Subsequently, I also, also put out a response to some of the media reports um, coming out on Commander. And I want to wait for one thing to happen. Those who are talking, they will stop talking. You go and build a factory, $35 million. That, that's the valuation. Because it's very easy for us to understand. You borrow $35 million, so the valuation of the company, obviously, <laughs> which has to be close to $35 million. Now, even those who were bidding at the time that the previous government 
was trying to, and that's another thing we have to correct. I heard people saying that, oh, the NDC never attempted to, uh, you know, sell and offload them. They commissioned the factory in May. Within two months, they were already selling the factory. They had recruited a transaction advisor to offload 70% of, of their interest. And the evidence is clear. Those who were even bidding two months after that, go and look at the figures they were quoting. Go and look at the figures they were quoting to buy a new factory. <laughs> you know? And even the one who was supposed to have uh, won the bid, later on the man came and said, oh, the factory is not worth the amount that they And he thought that they were going to use that money to recapitalize the, the business and not to buy and pay for the, uh, the factory. Subsequently, all the, uh, the work that has been done and the people who have expressed interest in Commander have said that that factory cannot cost 35 million. And remember, this is not about government doing the evaluation. There's a transaction advisor and it Chinese national has been arrested by the police in the northern region with four containers of rosewood timber. Ellen Huang, who was accompanying the truckloads of the timber when she was apprehended at the Viting barrier by the police. The suspect told the police she has permission to transport the wood to Tema. Ellen Huang, in a video circulating on social media, meanwhile alleged the police had demanded an amount of 8,000 Ghana cities in bribe from her, claiming that she was arrested because she refused to pay. And then when we go to Bali, policemen are demanding money. And because the negotiator is not well, that's why they send me to here. They were demanding money from you? Yes, How each much? container they are demanding for How 200 much? Ghana cities. Each container? Yes. And well, public relations also of the Northern Region Police Command, Yusif Tanko, has refuted the bribery allegation. She was arrested with a lot of rosewood and she can make any allegation that she wants to make. But so far as we are concerned, our men on the road have done a very good job. They've been able to arrest us and uh, it will help in the fight against the degradation of our forest. The regional command has issued instructions to all our officers on the checkpoint and also on patrols that when they encounter any load of rosewood, they should arrest it and bring it to the police station for necessary action. The allegation that she made, we will uh, find a way of looking into it, but for now, we think our men deserve commendation for what they have done. And what is the next line of action that you will take? We are in the process of investigations. When it gets there, we will see how to deal with it. Now, Helen Wang has, been, has since been granted bail. Government recently banned the harvest and transportation of the endangered species. Public Relations Officer of the Forestry Commission, Joyce Ufori Kwafu, joins me over the telephone. Good evening to you, uh, Joyce. Now, does the Commission know about Helen Wang's claims to have a permit? Hello? Hello, Joyce. Now, I'm asking, yes. does the Commission know, the Forestry Commission do you know about Helen Huang's claims to have a permit? Good evening, Israel. Yes, we have received information. I write it online. That is my joynewsonline.com. I've read about the story, and I've, I've spoken with the regional manager to get that information about this whole issue. I'm still waiting for him to get back to me before... I can come out with any if official information, which will be the hand of Forestry Commission on this issue. So, so that information gets to me. I cannot make any statement. You mean you that. can't? You can't even tell whether this Helen Huang has a, a, a permit from you? I'll, I'll have to. I'll also speak from. Uh, I'll, I'll have to hear from the regional manager first. All right. Because as I said, I have clothes from West. And if I have to check, it will have to be in the office. But we actually I have, have a ban. officers who are in charge 
of that. I bet they'll be in a position to tell me whether this lady in question has um, a payment or not. All right. But there is a ban in place uh, in, for the transportation of uh, rosewood. Do we, do, do yes, we have that there is. There is a ban in place. All right. So Which would mean... Place, whether he, he has a permit or not, it, it, it doesn't come in here because there is a ban, a complete ban on, on any activities on rosewood in the country. I would like you to elaborate on this ban. The ban is for failing transportation and exports. And what else? Yes, that is all. Failing, salvaging, transportation, exports, Every business in connection with rose food has been banned for now. Yes. So, so which whether have... he has a permit or not, it's neither here nor there because there is a complete ban. So whichever way we look at it, the conduct or the operations of uh, Helen Juan, as we have it, is against the law. Definitely. 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 All right. Thank you very much, uh, Joyce Kwafu. Thank Joyce. you, Israel. So as soon as I hear from the regional manager, I'll get back to you. All right. I'm thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Joyce. you so much. Joyce Kwafu is the public relations manager of the Forestry Commission. Moving on, plastic waste and weeds have taken over some drains along the Obechabi Kwame uh, Nkrumah Circle Interchange area in what could best be described as an eyesore at the time the door drain is being dredged. Some of the passageways of the drains have been blocked, and many fear disaster is imminent with the next rain. Komla Dome has more. This is the Awudome Cemetery area, a few meters away from the Kwame Nkrumah interchange. Right by the fencing is a drain taken over by weeds. Human activities close to the drain are minimal. But as we move up the stretch, we discover a displeasing spectacle. It may look like a dead end. But it's not. It is actually a drain along the stretch. An unpleasant clatter of plastic water bottles, drink containers, remnants of disposable packs used for selling food, among many other containers, twigs that have gathered here and have essentially blocked the passageway right under this bridge to the other end. Imagine what will happen here if there is an, a heavy rain or a heavy downpour. All of these may spill over onto the road and essentially floods will occur. Few meters up, a top layer of algae and water weed. The situation in front of a royal house chapel appears different. The portion of a drain had been desilted but the opening for the dark polluted water is blocked. Pedestrians and commuters here have to endure the foul stench wafting from the stagnant water. According to them, whenever it rains, the entire stretch gets heavily flooded. The gutter itself has choked. The entire area gets flooded whenever it rains. Flood waters from Kanishi all the way down the stretch because of choked gutters. Very serious. They say some contractors were here to cut down trees along the road to make way for some construction works. But the situation since then remains dire. The cut of the trees to make way for some construction work. The pollution continues. Several companies here are negatively impacted by the rains. The state housing company, banks, STC, among others, are just a few. Anochi believes the attitudes of people must change. People dump litter in the drains here because there are no dustbins as well. This is the other side of a drain um, on the Obichibi roundabout uh, circle stretch. And earlier, we saw on the other side of a drain where 
the hole had been taken over by plastic water bottles, drink containers and disposable food containers. This is where all of that is supposed to come through and then onwardly flow under this particular bridge into a drain across my left. But as it stands now, because of a choking at the other end, the water here is stagnant and all the refuse and the plastic that we saw in the drain there remain there. These drains flow into the main odor, which is being dredged by dredge masters. Our visit Monday revealed they were at site desilting. But the question some have asked is what happens to these small waterways and drains which have been completely taken over by unwanted materials and weeds? The Accra Metropolitan Assembly says it is part of a plan to desilt all drains on road shoulders in preparation for the rains. They are all part of um, the plants or the various drains is earmarked for the shooting at the rains uh, setting. So they, they, they are all part, not, not only that. Well, plastic manufacturers have asked government to shelve any plan to impose a full or partial ban on plastic materials, warning it will lead to significant job losses. The Ghana Plastic Manufacturers Association, in a petition to President Akufado, made four key demands, including the institution of a plastic levy fund authority to ensure the plastic waste menace is addressed. Ifwa Evans Chinri reports. Plastic waste formed 17% of our waste stream, but in 2008, plastic waste was just 2.8% of our waste composition. In the space of 11 years, the usage of plastics have grown by over 610% and many more products are switching to plastic packaging. At a press briefing on plastic pollution in Accra, plastic manufacturers outlined a number of demands they expect from government. Ebo Boche is president of the group. We want government to set up the Plastic Levy Fund Authority now. Government should not delay anymore. Government to release the 10% immediately. Meaning that um, that 912 million money, which is sitting somewhere cool, we need the money to come. Government should ban imports of flexible plastic bags and packaging. The industry here, we have the capacity at 56% utilization, we have excess capacity to be able to uh, produce. We want government to pass the LI on uh, our pet. If government would even give out the money or the grants to set up recycling plant for pet bottle waste, if there is no law to compel the bottling companies, if there is no law to compel a Bobochi Coca Cola uh, a company to use our pets for bottling, then it doesn't work. So that law is also important. He also mentioned that banning plastics outright will not be the solution to keeping our environment clean. He says government must consider managing plastics. The total employment generated by the plastic industry, the recycling sector and the plastic waste collectors is 3,732,770. We're taking a break here on Join News Prime, but still ahead, former GMPC chief executive challenges government's justification for amending its petroleum agreement with oil exploration firm AGM. We have to ask the right questions and we need to put them on the spot. You can't come and give us some information that is good for us. Show us the analysis. Show us why it is good for us. And in Business Institute of Directors, Ghana advocates amendment of aspects of the Presidential Transition Act to allow board members and chief executives of key government businesses to stay in office after change of government. Our current transitional act doesn't make good succession planning. There is a need to have a second look at that act.
Former Ghana National Petroleum Corporation Chief Executive Alex, Alex Mould says government had no justification to amend this petroleum agreement with AG and Petroleum for oil exploration in the deep southwest tunnel oil block. Parliament approved the amendment on Friday night, subject to a further amendment to increase the GNPC's additional interest in the block from 3 to 10%. He says his regime agreed with AGM to give GMPC 49% because GMPC had invested a lot of resources in the block before handing over to AGM for oil exploration. He questioned why government would agree to review the deal knowing that AGM is yet to commence work on the oil block. Parliament ratified it. Parliament approved it. Yeah, they approved it. But if you read the report, but they I cannot, said that subject if, if, to if you read if the you read statement, the right, if you the read statement the statement, the minister. if you read the statement AGM hmm. published internationally, it says it's been it's been approved. Full stop. No, but if you read the statement, I, I, from, I am, I am from telling you that if the minister, yes, it so said that subject to. The and and, the and then in six months time come and inform us. Come and inform us so what happens if AGM doesn't agree? In six months time they can't inform them. But meanwhile they are doing the work. So Parliament has to be very clear that they are approving this based on this, and that is it. They are ratifying the agreement based on it. What is this thing about you come in six months time and tell me? What are you telling me in six months time? There's no need for me to tell you anything. I have approved this. These are the conditions. Is it that you take it or you leave it? Now I am giving you leeway that oh, in six months' time, come and tell me what happened. So when you come in six months' time and say, I try negotiating with the guys, so they didn't agree, so we'll take it like that. What, what are you going to I'm say? Gonna... But the issue is what you have ratified is not even good because we had 49% or 43%. It depends on how you look at it. 49 to 18%. Mr. Mould also alleged the government is forcing foreign oil companies to change their local partners. He accuses government of deliberately delaying the license of some local companies. What I am hearing from the foreign companies and some of the local companies is that they are being asked to change their local partners. Some of them are being asked to change local partners to do specific work in other blocks. And the question is, why are local partners not speaking out? And why are foreign companies allowing this to happen? Because the Foreign Corruption Practice Act, FCPA, doesn't allow this to happen in the countries that they work. So why will they not refuse for that to happen? So Can we be specific on I, I mean, the, these companies that you mentioned? About no, them. I said you, you, should, you should do oh, some homework. No, you cannot deny. The data the, the data is there. The data is there and they are required to give you the data. You can find out if foreign companies have changed their local partners. And this is the issue that I believe we should stem in this country. We should make sure it stops in this country. You cannot allow fronting to happen. One, it is bad for the industry. And two, the foreign partners that come to work in your country now look at you differently. That despite the vision that you may have had, where you have enacted laws, local content laws, which are going to actually help develop the local uh, uh, companies in your country, now they, they are being told that you don't have to do that. You just have to take the local partners that we give you to work with. And this is something that is wrong in this country. Anything that will happen with the AGM and then Quad situation? Well, we shall, we shall see what happens, not in the Quad, we shall see what happens in the oil services part of the business, where the work that has to be done, whether they're going to tender, okay? Whether the local companies that are registering with these foreign companies, they actually uh, meet the foreign company's specifications. We're going to find out that. And I, this is going to be an eye-opener for people. And I just want these foreign companies to know that they are on, under no obligation by anybody in this country to force them to change a local partner. Unless, unless, well, then they should take it up with them and they should make noise. Because, you see, the Foreign Corruption Practices Act allows you to make noise and Ghana can be blacklisted. The embassies will should be involved in this to make sure they put pressure on government to do the right thing. 
Elsewhere, the management of Meridian Port Services Limited has fought off claims its expansion of the Tumor Port will lead to more than 1,400 workers losing their jobs. The Trade Union Congress during the May Day celebrations appealed to President Akufado to review the contract, insisting it is not in the interest of the state. Management of the company, however, disagrees, insisting Ghana's economy will see significant growth once the first phase is completed in June. There is more in the following report. The Tema Port expansion project launched in June 2015 was tagged as key to increasing trade flow and general business activities in the sub-region. The project is being executed by the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, representing government and Meridian Port Holdings. The Trade Union Congress during the May Day celebration claimed many workers risked losing their jobs. Our analysis showed that when the new terminal commences operation in June, with the monopolistic rights given to MPS, Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority and other operators at the Tema Port are going to lose huge revenues that may lead to the collapse of many container-related businesses. This will translate into massive job losses in the maritime industry. GPHA may declare over 1,400 workers redundant in 2019 alone. Mr. President, if the contract is not reviewed and MPS commences operation in the new terminal in June, Ghana will surely lose millions of US dollars in revenue. CEO of Meridian Port Services Limited, Mohamed Samara, however, disagrees. MPS is relocating its services. We handle 90% of the containers inside the port. We're relocating the services into this platform. As you have seen, this platform is much bigger than that one. So we will need more staff. Also, our outsourced services, truckers, and this, they will need more people. We need more security men. We need more tally men. We need more cleaners. Every job scale size, we need more. So we're going to employ more people. Not only that, we're going to operate 24-7 because one of the efficiencies that the, 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 the customs and the Office of His Excellency asked us to do is to work 24-7 like all other ports in this world and create a, an efficient platform for that purpose. So by working 24-7, we need more immigration, more uh, standard board, we need more food and drugs, we need more customs for sure, that's the bulk. We need more people to man the scanners and what happens after the scan. We need to create... An avalanche of jobs, you know, for the sub. He argues Ghana is positioning itself to play a key role in regional trade. People, so there is huge direct and indirect, you know, jobs for the stakeholders of this port. Let alone this. If you find 20 new yard cranes, and you have at least two people mounting each crane per shift for three shifts, then you can see that straight away, even that one translates into a number of jobs. You look at the ship to shore cranes, a number of jobs. You look at the new uh, trucks that will be added on, a number of jobs. You look at these buildings, cleaning areas, a number of jobs. We currently in the range of 2,000, I would say, direct and indirect jobs through our additional... The expansion will, among others, make it possible for the port to berth some of the world's largest vessels and also significantly increase the speed with which freight is offloaded and loaded. Industry players believe speed with which freight will be processed at the port will enhance its attractiveness and efficiency, which will in turn positively impact on trade between Ghana and its landlocked neighbors. Lawyer for Joy News is Manasseh Azura Winnie has described as utterly baseless government's complaint to the National Media Commission against Joy News's documentary Militia in the Heart of the Nation. The government filed the case through Information Minister Kojo Oponkrumah claiming the documentary which showed a militia group affiliated to the MPP training at the former seat of government, the Christian Bo Castle here in Accra, as misle is misleading and calculated a causing panic. Samson Ladia Yenini gave the status of the case before the Media Commission in the following interview on the Super Morning Show. Upon his instructions and consultations with him and together with the multimedia group, he has put together a very formidable uh, response to the complaint that was made by government to the NMC. He has uh, an 18-page response. Um, and I will say that it is not mere words on paper, but it is something that without 
without uh, too much consideration will will clearly show that what is before the NMC is very useless, uh, utterly baseless. Um, fact is that what he did, he did on the basis of evidence. He gathered facts. He didn't manufacture any facts. He gathered facts, provable facts, verifiable facts. And if you think that his interpretation of the facts, you have an issue with that, that is not the basis for you to waste anybody's time at the NMC. Unfortunately, that is what is going on um, by a government that has enjoyed the credit of uh, pursuing and being at the forefront of uh, press freedom. The next hearing of the case at the Media Commission is Wednesday, May 8. The government is represented by the state's Deputy Attorney General Godfrey Dame and Information Minister Kujo Opon Krumah. Government has meanwhile come in for criticism over its apparent boycott of Joy News since the airing of the Joy News documentary Militia in the Heart of the Nation. Speaking on News File over the weekend, managing editor of the New Crusading Guide newspaper, Abdul Malik Kubaku Jr., described government's action as cowardly. I, I just, last week I wanted to speak on this. Is there an official government boycott of news file or of the multimedia? Is there? There seems to be something like that, even though they don't seem to be properly coordinated. But um, you, they try, producers tell you, we contact this person and they tell you that we are told not to speak until maybe we get an apology, as if it's I, I, I pray it's not official, because mm. otherwise it's cowardly and unstrategic and I didn't expect that to come from the MPP. It won't be the first time a government is boycotting the but, multimedia but group. Exactly. You read my mind. I said I didn't expect that from them. Mm. We've had a situation where governments and parties have boycotted this station before. including <coughs> the, well, I remember the Amina story. Yes, also. yes. Amina uh, Bas. Uh, Amina <laughs> Bas story. Uh -huh. But I didn't expect it to come from the MPP. Well, for the NDC, they were bold enough to announce it publicly. The MPP doesn't seem that, to be bold enough to say one. so. That's a courageous one. But that's mm. why I said this is cowardly and unstrategic. And if there's any such policy, I'm appealing to government and the party to review it as soon as possible. And it is not in the known character exactly, of this government. Exactly, ma'am. So it's we cowardly. should also pay attention. Let's see it. It's cowardly. Information Minister Kojo Ponkruma has meanwhile refuted claims government is boycotting Joy News. Speaking on Assem Prayer from Tuesday, he however explained government is engaging management of multimedia on a few outstanding issues he hopes will be resolved soon. Yeah, we well, say a buying issue in official circular say or boycott Joy FM. And I mean yeah, we well, say a buying officially a boycott Joy FM. In fact, I was joy news editor of his question. I am not aware of any boycott of Joy News and or Joy FM. In fact, I have been in constant touch and I've been interacting with managers of the multimedia group. The challenge we have has to do with a certain disagreement between us on the government side and the multimedia group on the other side. Something I must say that we are working together to resolve as partners. Uh, and no explaining why uh, uh, you and your government rep be on news file for some time now. Um, let me say about the absence of an MPP rep on news file, let me say it right here that I have not received any invitation from the producers of the show to appear on it. Because yes, I mean, Kwan, I may the politician there, which may be a producer, a producer program. No, in fact, I'm only making time because I insisted, say, I will say, you're balanced. Me insist, you're not a member. Eventually, me quiet. You try very hard to have a decent conversation without it getting political in any way. There are days, sir, 
on the fair NDC, on the and Child laborers who were once forced to fish on the Volta Lake have underscored the need for the practice to be abolished to avert any more deaths. It is estimated that hundreds of children are forced to work under slave like conditions, with many of the children drowning in the process. A 21 year old man, Godsin Glau, who was rescued in 2015, has been talking about the cruel treatment he received from his master, who came from his, for him from his parents when he was only seven years old. He says he worked on the Volta Lake for 10 years and at a point nearly committed suicide. Gotsin, who still bears the scar of an injury he suffered when he hit his chest against a stump in the lake, says he saw the remains of his colleague who drowned on the lake. Now an ambassador for the international justice movement, Gotsin has been sharing his story to audiences around the world and was recently at a human rights event in Texas, United States of America. Lake Volta has a booming fishing industry, a source of livelihood for many who live along its banks, but also a source of pain and anguish for many children who are taken from different places in Ghana to work as child slaves. The trip to the island community of Edrakota was like a journey to eternity. Please say they had done extensive work prior to the rescue mission. The suspects are here, but surprisingly, all the children in the community have gone missing. The only people here on the banks of the river are women and men. We can't find the children. The team will later learn the community had prior information. According to Deputy Public Relations Office of the Eastern Regional Police, Francis Gomado, the boat owners hit the children in their rooms adjoining communities and the bush. And when I, I was probing further to know the reason why we couldn't meet the children, it was clear from the chief's own words that he was even telling the people that they should let the children come so that we have interview with them. Those that are supposed to be helped will help them, but they didn't listen. We have it in mind that we don't want to antagonize anybody. It is 4.33 a.m. Um, right now and what is happening behind me, um, we have the arrival of some of the suspected um, traffic children. After many hours of interrogation by the Criminal Investigations Department, we've had um, these children um, arriving um, here and the rest of the process will continue. Police picked intelligence. The children were being transported back to Ningo Pram Pram where they were taken. Deputy PRO of the Eastern Region Police provides details. They were put in a car, a bus, with one male and one female to actually lead them to where they brought them from. And the vehicle that was transporting the 16 of the traffic children, suspected traffic children, were intercepted at Atimpoku. <laughs> Five years old. I follow grandfather to the farm and watch what he's doing. I am nine years old. I never want to leave this place. I always help my grandfather in the market. When I left home with my uncle, I didn't see my grandparents anymore. The first time I went on the lake. I wanted to escape. But I didn't know the way. Get 
jamming. If you uh, want more on the uh, Liverpool's victory over Barca, there's the Fan Zone, which comes up at 10 p.m. with Hans Spencer and uh, that comes up after uh, PM Express. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Israel. Bye. Have a good night.